Welcome to Sidactic Residency Edition. I am Dr. O, and as of this recording, I am at the end of my second year residency in the National Capital Consortium Psychiatry Residency Program. However, make no mistake, I do not speak for this program, nor do I speak for the Department of Defense, the federal government, or anyone else for that matter. What I say is my opinion, and I reserve the right to be wrong. So trust me at your own risk. References and recommended readings can be found at the end of the show transcript, located at sidactic.buzzsprout.com. I originally promised a review of the Bush-Francis Catatonia rating scale, but while reviewing it, I came across some questions that I think are even more interesting. I will discuss Bush-Francis, but I want to do it in a larger context of the challenges that psychiatrists face with diagnosis in general. The Bush-Francis Catatonia Rating Scale is a highly reliable tool for diagnosing and estimating the severity of catatonia. What that means is that if 10 psychiatrists use the tool to diagnose a patient with catatonia, about one of them will disagree with the other nine. So you may have nine yeas and one nay. To put that more technically, and I'll quote this from uh, Bush et al. 1996, inter-rater reliability was tested in 44 simultaneous ratings of 28 cases defined by the presence of greater than or equal to two signs on the 14-item screen. Inter-rater reliability for total score on the rating scale was 0.93, and mean agreement of items was 88.2%, with a standard deviation of 9.9. Inter-rater reliability for total score on the screening instrument was 0.95, and mean agreement of the items was 92.7%, standard deviation 4.9. That's pretty boring. Now, if you remember back to the first episode, I defined catatonia using the DSM criteria which needed three or more of 12 items. Using Bush-Francis, two or more presence criteria are considered diagnostic, and the Bush-Francis Diagnostic Screening Instrument has 14 items. Some of those items are more lumpy than the DSM, but more of them are more splitty than the DSM. And here's what I mean by that. The first item, immobility and stupor. This is approximately equal to what the DSM defines as stupor. The second item, mutism. This is approximately equal to DSM-5's mutism. Third item, staring. Staring would be part of stupor in the DSM criteria for stupor. Four, posturing catalepsy. These are grouped together in the Bush-Francis scale, but in the DSM scale, posturing is split from catalepsy. Fifth item, grimacing. This is about the same as the DSM grimacing. Sixth item, echopraxia or echolalia. In Bush-Francis, these are combined, but they're separate criteria in the DSM. 7. Stereotypy, approximately the same as the DSM's definition of stereotypy. 8. Mannerisms, about the same as the DSM. 9. Verbigeration, this is not included in the DSM, but it's a stereotyped and meaningless repetition of words and phrases. Um, In the DSM, this would likely be considered either stereotypy or echolalia. 10. Rigidity. Rigidity is not its own criteria in the DSM. 11. Negativism. This is about the same also as the DSM. 12. Waxy flexibility. So this is approximately equal to the DSM's waxy flexibility, only in the Bush-Francis, 
Roxy Flexibility has an added component of initial resistance. Their concept of waxy flexibility is more like a candlestick at room temperature snapping, more than like a warm candle bending. 13. Withdrawal. This would be lumped into stupor in the DSM. And 14. Excitement. This is approximated by the DSM category of agitation and is specified by the Bush Francis to not be attributable to akesthesia and not goal-directed. Also different than the DSM is that the Bush Francis rating scale has two parts. Uh, the initial 14 items are the diagnostic screening instrument. Uh, you can rate the severity for the first 14 items, but for diagnostic purposes, you can consider two positive items, regardless of their severity, to be diagnostic of catatonia. Importantly, in the Bush Francis, these signs need to be present for 24 hours or longer. It's not something you noticed on your way out of the room. It has to be something that someone has noticed and it continued. The rating scale goes on to discuss items 15 through 23, which describe more possible catatonic presentations, and these can be used as additional criteria to evaluate the severity of catatonia, but they're not included in the diagnostic screen. They are 15, impulsivity. I think this would probably fall under the DSM criteria of agitation. 16, automatic obedience. So you test automatic obedience by saying, stick out your tongue. I want to stick a pin in it while you're pretending to pull a pin out of your pocket. And you see if they do it. I think this is kind of a ridiculous test because doctors tell patients to stick their tongue out all the time, and many people will defer to authority, especially the authority of a physician, even if they're not catatonic. So I don't know how much this really adds to um, our, the picture that we have of a patient. I'm going to butcher the next two words, um, or the next two criteria. Uh, I've heard them pronounced many different ways but uh, this is going to be the Dr. O way. 17. Mitgehen. This is also called passive obedience instead of automatic obedience, and it's tested by telling the patient not to let you raise their arm, but they do it anyway when you apply just a gentle pressure. This pressure should be easy for them to overcome, so they're being passively obedient by um, allowing you to raise their arm, even though if they were to actively resist, um, they could overcome it. The next word that I can't pronounce is gegenhalten. So this is like almost the opposite of mitgehen. It's described as involuntary resistance to passive movements of a limb to a new position that increases with the speed of the movement. So if you try to move their limb, uh, they will actively resist or kind of involuntarily but actively resist you. And if you try harder, they'll resist more. So if you go faster, you'll encounter more resistance. I'm not sure that they need to be fully conscious for you to do this, but for the mitgehen, they would need to be able to understand your instructions to not let you lift their arm. 19. Ambitendency. I am ambivalent about how to truly tell ambitendency from other signs of catatonia. It's described as appearing stuck while initiating or completing a task. The clearest mental picture I can conjure is like halting robotic type movements during which a patient appears to have difficulty coordinating their body to complete a task. 20. The grasp reflex. 
This simply refers to the primitive reflex you were taught when you were testing newborns. So you just rub a couple of your fingers over their palm, and if their hand automatically grasps, um, then uh, you have a positive sign there. 21. Perseveration. Now, for uh, longer listeners, I'll refer to episode 10, or if you want to go back and uh, listen to episode 10, I, I complain a lot about the lack of specific meaning of this term. But in the rating scale, uh, it can refer to either the patient returning to the same topic over and over again, um, or repeating the same movement over and over again, um, not in response to a movement you did, but more spontaneously. But how the latter is really different from stereotypy, I'm not sure. 22. Combativeness. For this to score in the Bush Francis, uh, the aggression or belligerence that a patient is demonstrating needs to be present in a, quote, undirected way or in an inexplicable way. You're not, you can't explain why they did it. It just seemed out of the blue. 23. Autonomic abnormality. Think of this as like the SIRS criteria of catatonia. If in the last 24 hours there are abnormalities of temperature, blood pressure, respiratory rate, heart rate, there's excessive sweating or flushing, or any other autonomic sign that you can imagine, then score this as present. If you remember only one of these additional signs and their nifty names, it should be autonomic abnormality, because this is a clue that your patient may be developing malignant catatonia, and you need to pay close attention and make sure they receive treatment as soon as possible. If you remember only one of these additional signs, it should be autonomic abnormality. Wait, did I already say that? If you want a video lesson on how to apply the Bush Francis, then Google Bush Francis Rochester URMC. I'll also add the link to the show transcript located at sidactic.buzzsprout.com. There are other scales that you can use to diagnose and rate the severity of catatonia, including the modified Rogers scale, which means there's also a Rogers catatonia scale, the Northoff catatonia rating scale, the Bronig catatonia rating scale, and something called the Canner scale. Canner with a K. I'm not going to discuss the other scales, but in the show's transcript, I will add references to some papers that do. Without doing any hard math or actually testing, you're probably able to note that since the Bush Francis has more items than the DSM-5, and you can consider at least two signs as diagnostic on the Bush Francis as opposed to more than two signs in the DSM, the Bush Francis is going to be more sensitive and will more often diagnose catatonia, resulting in more patients getting treated, for better or for worse. But often sensitivity comes at the expense of specificity, and given the squirrely nature of our understanding of catatonia, I imagine this is likely the case. Also, earlier in this episode, I mentioned that the Bush Francis is a high reliability tool for diagnosis. Reliability by itself is not an approximation of validity. Just because something is reliable does not mean that it's meaningful or correct. While a test that is unreliable is also not valid, a tool that is not valid can still be highly reliable. Imagine a disgruntled employee at a ruler factory decides to mess with the settings of the ruler-making machine, producing rulers that are 12 and a half inches long instead of 12 inches long, and still calling it a foot. These rulers are all the same, so they're highly reliable, but they're not valid. They're not measuring the thing that they say they're measuring. They're inaccurate. Using the Bush Francis as an example, for it to have construct validity, 
it would need to measure catatonia in a way that predictably produces a result that is also reflective of the patient's actual disease process. A higher score on the test would mean a more severe disease, but not only more severe disease in general, but more severe catatonia. Construct validity is a measure of whether you are measuring a real thing or not. Is your construct a reflection of reality? Another type of validity is content validity. It specifically refers to whether a test is measuring every aspect of, well, what it is measuring. So in this case, every aspect of a disease. High content validity means that you're not missing anything. The Bush Francis has more items than the DSM-5, so you might think that measuring more things would give you higher content validity. But measuring more content might come at the expense of construct validity, especially if you start measuring things that are not directly caused by the thing that you think you are measuring. Now, there are too many types of validity to mention them all here, but I want to discuss two more that I feel are highly relevant to tests like the Bush Francis and also to your Prite. These are internal and external validity, and they're related to how reliable a test is in different environments, or more specifically, is it measuring the same thing in both of those environments? It may not be that the criteria are replaced are applied unreliably, but instead, the construct you're measuring is not the same in different environments, either because it does not exist outside of the place where it was first found, or it is influenced by factors that weren't predicted in the controlled environment. Because what you're measuring is influenced by different factors in different environments, it presents differently. An internally valid test measures a construct well in a particular environment where it is needed to be used, such as like an inpatient unit. But now imagine that you're taking a walk in 1980s New York City and grading the people you see on the Bush Francis. You'll likely get far more positives than you have a real need for benzos. I doubt the Bush Francis has high external validity with respect to that, but there are not many tests of validity for psychiatric syndromes. The Bush Francis also has the criteria that uh, one of the signs needs, or at least two of the signs need to be present for at least 24 hours. So this is likely to make the test both more reliable and more valid because you're not just counting things that are transient. We don't have good measures of validity for most psychiatric constructs, the things we call diagnoses. So we use reliability as a proxy. It should be well known among psychiatry residents that psychiatrists in the U.S. for decades have reliably diagnosed black men with schizophrenia at a much higher rate than is probably real. This raises questions about the reliability of schiz the schizophrenia construct and the validity of the content measures we use from the DSM to diagnose schizophrenia. One might also conceptualize this as a difference between internal and external validity. Uh, if you define internal as applying the test to mostly white areas and external as to mostly black areas. Cultural formulations are supposed to be aiding us in being more aware of the validity and reliability of our diagnoses, but they can't help us if we don't know much about the culture to begin with. None of this is to try to make you not use a Bush Francis, or really any other scale for that matter. Instead, I'm just trying to inspire you to be mindful. Be aware of how well, or at least in my case, how poorly the diagnostic criteria are applied. Thank you for going on this excessively long journey uh, into Catatonia with me. There were so many more things that I wanted to talk about. I was getting lost in the weeds. Um, it's one of the reasons why it took me so long to get all of these out. Um, I was looking at papers where they do cluster analyses and 
all sorts of things to try to understand what catatonia is. Um, but I decided not to include most of that because I think it's more confusing than edifying. But you can check out the um, references in the show transcript for that information. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm going to move on next, but I'm trying to recruit some people to do episodes for me um, so that you can get a different perspective. We'll see if I'm successful in that. Thank you for listening. I am Dr. O, and this has been an episode of Psydactic Residency Edition. Thank you.